right? Like it really does. So it's like, hello. It's like a meditation to be here together. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. So we're on live now. We've got the red, the red button going and I'm here in my living room with Fabian. Will you say your last names? Boothalette. Ooh. Boothalette. <clears throat> Boutier was probably the original. Okay. Okay. Fabian Yves Boutier. Ooh, Fabian is actually the way to say it. Okay. Yeah, and actually, yeah. Fabian. What is your um, ethnic background and such? How do you describe yourself? I never asked that of you. I mean, my mother's Puerto Rican. Okay. And wow. straight up Puerto Rican, and my ah. and like by straight up Puerto Rican, like from the island, and uh, my dad's French Canadian. Ah, ah. So the island, you are, you have that island background because I was telling you you have like a pirate look going last time I saw you, which yes. goes with your naval background, right? <laughs> really? Maybe. So there's island um, in your blood too, huh? You know, I read, I just read an article recently where. Uh, <laughs> oh, cut off. Says I'm cut off. All right, let's it doesn't see. look you like I'm cut off. Well, in. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, sure. I just, I was just reading an article two days ago about people who go like American African Americans who go back to Africa and feel at home and then how that like that's a phenomenon for a lot of a lot of people who mm. for Americans especially we go back to where our parents and grandparents are from and it's and they feel very comfortable there. Mm. When I have visited Puerto Rico and I have been there for a while now, I felt that way. It was mm. it was quite eye opening to me because I just view myself as uh, and, you know, I'm just an American dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't really think about... I, I'm white. Like, to me, yeah, I'm just a white guy. Mm -hmm. And then some people are like, well, you're not like the whitest white. I'm like, no, I'm not the whitest white, whatever. <laughs> I really don't think about mm -hmm. it that hard. I just don't. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Puerto Rico and I was like, man, I mm -hmm. just get along with people here. Even though my Spanish is terrible. And or non-existent at this point, but, uh, that's not fair. That's not true. But just bad Spanish, like <laughs> women were just coming up to me and talking to me and mm -hmm. just the dancing. And I was mm -hmm. like, Oh my God, this is, I actually felt at home anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then even last time I talked to you too, at the coffee shop, we were talking about your naval background. Cause I think that's, what's so interesting about you is your, or one of the interesting things about you is your military background. Right. Yeah. And then that now you've become this like super, um, um, well-rounded practitioner of many sorts. So, but that, yeah, you did get into the Navy because of a love for water and ships and boats was part of what drove you there. Well, what drove me there was, that was just the flavor I chose okay, okay. of public service. Yeah, yeah. But what, what did drive you there? That is kind of cool to hear if you're willing to share. I, th I think quite, I mean, look, growing up in Arlington, Virginia, obviously ah. in the heart of the empire and the, the Pentagon right there, obviously an influence, obviously. I just mm -hmm. have always felt prone to public service. Mm -hmm. And then I think about it, every job I've ever had was service oriented in some way. So coming out of high school was like, I want to do something good with my life and something of service. And let me, what's the most like cool, epic way for me to do that to me was the Navy. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you was like, and not just history. enlist either, uh, like go to the Naval Academy and become an officer, uh -huh. like do, do the whole fucking shebang. Yeah. So you were deep in it. And how many years were you in it? Were you identified as being six? In? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Right. And, and then, yeah, that somehow now you've come and how many years since then that now you've come to do yeah. the cool things you're doing? <laughs> well, look, being a veteran and Veterans Day is coming up is it, it, well, for me, it's interesting because since I've got out of the Navy, I've been a high school teacher, a bartender, I was a personal assistant to a very famous person named Gore Vidal, uh, and then did some freelance editing and kind of sort of my spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. So that's for, it's all, it's over 14 years since I've been out of the Navy, okay. yet yeah. it is just such the overwhelming event in my history 
Oh, it is. It does feel that way. It does too. feel that way. Yeah. Like okay. bartending, whatever. The high school teaching I did, whatever. Oh. A lot of things I did, whatever. I can remember them. They have value. But the veteran thing is just so overwhelming. And I think, uh, I don't think I'll ever let go of it because it's, it is authentic to who I am. Mm -hmm. Like the Navy in particular. There's mm -hmm. so much I have to say about what it means to be on that self-contained community in the middle of the ocean where you have to succeed that is the experience I'll, uh, yeah. I'll probably never have again unless which I encourage people to do expand that's a microcosm expand that out from ship to like spaceship earth mm. and think about being a crew member of spaceship earth mm. uh. So it got you in that team mentality. <laughs> yeah. I just realized the Earth team, right? Yeah. Uh, mm. Yeah, and I think a lot of us who uh, are... Like, I'm very comfortable using the spiritual label and a lot of the wooiness, although I'm certainly... I think really one thing we could talk about any any time is to critique the wooiness mm. and be like, this is where it's going too far or it's mm. going astray. Mm. Uh, and I believe having been in the military and not come into spirituality until I was thir 30, mm -hmm. 31 years old. Mm. Which uh, is, yeah, which is still young though, right? Like you've already had this like rich full life by 30 though, really because being uh, in the military just seems like you get so much adult intense experience like at like high level so yeah <laughs> you like get high adult training yeah in, sense. in some in many like ways in, uh, yes yeah yeah and I don't know if I've ever found out from you like did you get into because I've seen like you're such a healer now and you're in a lot of healing work with a lot of your modalities yeah was that because you were needing that so much yourself yeah related to the military or not necessarily related to the military? I would, I would say that the <laughs> healing, yes, mm. that the healing from the military drove, mm. like, it was like, oh, I'm a veteran and I'm depressed and there's PTSD, so it's related to the military. Yes, right, okay. Which yeah. it is. And so much of it has been, for sure. What I feel, and then the VA puts you through this whole thing of proving that your depression or PTSD or mental health issue is service connected. And what to me is ridiculous about that. Well, wait, well, well, what's fair about that is like, yeah, if you just went and served in the Air Force and you were a dental technician and all you ended up doing was cleaning people's teeth for three years, mm -hmm. that's different from being like, uh, a paratrooper or someone who's special forces mm -hmm. fighting all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like we have to really they're, they're they're like the people think about the military in the monolithic way and it's terrible to think about it that way. But uh so it, did things happen to me? <laughs> And I even struggled using that to me language mm. because because I've already trained myself. I'm tra out of having that victim mentality of things happening to me. Wow. But things happened that physically injured me and mentally injured me. Okay, so yes, without my impetus to figure that out and cleanse myself of that, and what all I figured out was everyone is traumatized. I've realized, and we all. Just simple child psychology. Something happens age 0 to 8, 0 to 10, whatever. Mm. If you happen to go in the military kind of straight out of high school when you're mm. 18, mm. now that's going to get cranked up. <laughs> it cranks so up whatever your limiting beliefs, whatever your, wow. whatever your limiting beneath, they could be benign too. We all have limiting beliefs. Mm. We all have fears. We all have things that bother us. We all have a certain amount of anxiety. Mm -hmm. So now you go right into the military and it's going to immediately just blast that up like all the way, especially if you get around combat. So uh, is my PTSD service connected? Sure. Mm -hmm. But then I realized as I dug into it and kept digging, kept digging, it was like, oh, well, why was I prone to anxiety in the first place? Why was mm -hmm. I prone to being this emotionally sensitive in the first place? Uh -huh. And then they just kept going and going and going and going. Mm. And that has 
driven my particular path, which I believe is centered on self-study. Mm. I'm very self-study oriented mm. and uh, oriented towards practicing witness perspective. So, mm. And how much... I happen to have made my video today about how self-awareness is like such the therapy, right? And it's like, so like, sounds like what, that's what you're talking about. Just all the things you've been able to do to witness yourself. Yeah. And, and the, then yeah. what you do from there. <laughs> right? The big trick of it is that we lie to ourselves. Uh, so as a practitioner, now that I'm a practitioner mm, of healing, mm, really all I'm doing is working to enroll my clients into their own deconstruction. Woo! Get <laughs> them, right get them, that's it. That's all I'm enroll doing. Enroll them into their own deconstruction. Like, and I have all sorts and of... And then reconstruction? Eventually. Yeah. yeah. But once, they, once they're enrolled into deconstruction, okay. generally they'll reconstruct themselves on their own. Pe oh, because people want that. to, because that's oh. the more fun part. Wow. I want this beautiful thing, and I want oh. that, and I want this experience. Mm. And I'm like, great. Mm. Not everyone, it, not everyone actually does have that e easy of a time with mm -hmm. it. People mm -hmm. do. Plenty of people have not thought about what they want out of life. Right. Plenty of people yeah. have not done that. I'm more on the side of let's let go of the limiting beliefs and be honest with, let's figure out how to generate feedback for ourselves. Let's train ourselves to accept feedback. Mm -hmm. Let's train ourselves to look at the dirty little secrets about ourselves <laughs> and be able to find it on our own, or at least be willing to ask other people to tell us about our dirty little secrets. Mm -hmm. And that's not comfortable. Hmm. People put up tons of resistance to that. <laughs> I feel resistance even as you it, say yes, that. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> it doesn't, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, we can do exactly what I need to So say. that's where like I make my money, if you will. Like mm. if I can get people to be like, hey, mm. to be like, you know what? I'm over it. I'm sick of suffering. I want to be greater. And part of being greater is accepting feedback and feeling mm. all the shame and anger and regret and guilt and those things in particular. The shame, anger, fear, guilt that has and re regret, did I say regret, that has built up in my life. If I can really look at that and let it go, mm. uh -huh. then, then, uh, then that's really what's going to, that's the quality, that's the kind of quality. Mm. The, quality deconstruction. Deconstruction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah and that yeah, to me yeah. feels like I can see how that plays into how you work with because I know you do a lot of like leadership work and I know you have a lot of understanding of like management and systems, right? And organizations and... Yeah, and in that and, way the Navy officer so that training... that to me makes sense. Yeah. Even that piece would be important for like a leader to get good at receiving feedback, right? And, yes. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, well, Because of how course. much does that, start, you know, impact leadership if you're not able to receive feedback, much less, right? <laughs> it might be... It might be complaint... <laughs> It might be the number one complaint mm -hmm. employees have about <laughs> right. their bosses is uh, that they are don't listen or mm -hmm. they're inflexible. Right, and that could be the reason you know, the resistance to hearing your dark, dark little secrets yeah. that you're getting that feedback on. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and I know you have so many modalities that you use and share and have people work with to do that. Right, like. I always quote you when I talk about journaling now. Yeah. <laughs> like, I feel like you're like a local journaling expert. Um, I think I'm more, th more than local. Oh yeah, international. I was going to say that next. You're international. I mean, I'm, I'm kidding. When oh, I'm, yeah. When I'm, I, as far right as... Right this moment, you're international. <laughs> <laughs> as far as journaling goes, mm. I think I'm all over it. Mm. Well, because the one thing I always I quote you on is that you taught me to say and to realize that it helps me stay current with myself. Yeah. Right. And speaking of self awareness and therapy and that observer perspective. So, and when did you first start using the journaling? Was that something you were using in the military? Remind me. I did. Oh. Well, I mean, in fifth grade, teacher made our class journal. Mm. And it stuck. Like, I really, I wasn't one of the kids that had to be, like, encouraged and forced to journal. Like, mm. I was just like, oh, yeah, this is great. I just, I can write down what I'm thinking or feeling every day. And it's, I like it. I would say then, down in the middle, I would say in middle and high school, I didn't really journal that much through middle school and high school. Mm. Some. Mm. Even to do some as like a boy in, in Virginia. <laughs> yeah, I guess right? so. It's, kind of it's not something most middle and high school boys are sitting around 
teen in coffee boy, shops right? journaling. Which is cool to hear because I know you work with teen boys, for instance, now. So that's kind of interesting, maybe for some of them to hear that you were actually doing a little journaling at that age. And then it became a tool that you're still using. <laughs> yeah, actually. And teaching. <laughs> I, would, I would say that um, I've all, well, one thing I realized about myself, I've always been prone to uh, psychology and philosophy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I always have. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. It wasn't like yeah. it happened when I started deconstructing right. myself for healing. Yeah. I was like, oh, I always have been uh -huh. actually. Yeah, I just gave you the reason to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. And then I just love that you're just, in one example that you are, is someone who, as a, a veteran, who came out, you know, feeling impaired by it even and now that you brought yourself to thriving really right that you're like expressing yourself in so many cool ways right <laughs> and um you and your wife are like local rock stars and right I mean that's such a cool like how much growth you've taken yourself through you know something that could be something that a lot of people would feel like they could never get get well, over right much less thrive not that you know within 10 years or whatever it's been. You said 14 years, but yeah, I mean, you were thriving. <laughs> what I, what, yeah. Right? Yeah, for sure. Mm. What I'm, what even occurring to me in this moment mm. that I would say to people is I threw myself into the Navy mm. and being a Navy officer. It wasn't, I didn't dabble in it. I didn't try to do it. I did it and I committed to it. Yeah. Then I have thrown myself into what people would call mystical, spiritual, new age, wooey, mm. like whatever. I can out woo anybody. <laughs> Seriously, I don't need a fucking man bun and flowy clothing to show you how wooey. Like mm -hmm. I will, I get all the things that wooey people are saying. I've, mm -hmm. I've read it. I've watched the YouTube videos. I've gone down more rabbit holes than probably you have. Now I'm, you know, now I'm getting competitive about it. I, but I've been there. Competitive wooey. So I've been like all out, pure military structure, mm. and then I've gone all into like, mm -hmm. like, uh, oh, I'm gonna manifest abundance, and like, <laughs> which every which everyone still wants and talks about, mm -hmm. and I and I have found a measure of balance between mm -hmm. the two for myself mm -hmm. that I think. Uh, I so when I look at people who are still in the military, it's very easy to be like Jesus Christ. You guys need healing, like you you all. But I can also look at the people who are too wooey and be like, mm -hmm. you know what? You guys need to be more grounded. Mm -hmm. You need you need more roots. Mm -hmm. You and mm -hmm. so I'll take anyone on, <laughs> and it's kind of just my way of continuing to take on myself mm -hmm. because I think. All life coaches, if you're interested in coaching, therapize, therapy, therapizing, <laughs> therapy, <laughs> remember, like, again, I believe ultimately what we're doing is getting people enrolled in their own care. Mm, mm, mm. And I actually think it's professionally irresponsible to make someone dependent on you mm. for their healing. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think it's. I, I think it's. I think it's irresponsible. It'd be yeah. very easy to be a Reiki practitioner, not to pick on Reiki at all. <laughs> I'll just be fine. I'll pick on myself. It'd be very easy to be a journaling practitioner mm -hmm. or EFT, which mm -hmm. is my other thing, emotional freedom technique. And people come see me for EFT or any anything, and they feel better. Mm -hmm. So they come. They exchange money. There's an exchange of mm -hmm. value. Mm -hmm. But if all I'm giving them is feeling better in that moment, mm -hmm. and then maybe for a few more hours, or maybe even a few more days, that then it, then it's it's the it's the classic you you know teach give someone a fish or teach mm -hmm. them how to fish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you're not constantly trying to get people enrolled in their own spiritual path, mm -hmm. no, you go figure out what's curious mm -hmm. curious to you. You go mm -hmm. read books. You figure out what YouTube holes you like. You figure out which new age talker you like. Mm -hmm. And and you figure out what ways of being really work for you. Beingness is a, whole, a topic we could also spend mm -hmm. uh, itself a lot of time on. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it's 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 irresponsible as a practitioner i think if that's not like your full on intention mhm mhm yeah it's unempowering almost right to make someone dependent on you as as the agent of the transformation right even if you are part of <laughs> Part of the agency of transformation. Yeah, so I agree. I like and that and I would say scarce. Mm. Mm. The scarcity—it's like a scarcity of thinking approach kind of a thing. I think for some people, and I see this with like personal trainers and gyms, they—if I empower the person so much that they don't need me anymore, well, now mm. I have to go find another client yeah. to pay me to make money yeah. and have my life. Yeah. So this mm. this kind of economy in the first place perhaps isn't that good. Like mm-hmm. we got to figure out a better economy mm-hmm. anyway. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a scarcity conversation mm-hmm. or a, like I love being on this path of coaching and whatever you want to call it. I call it coaching because ultimately I'm embedding myself into someone's life, mm-hmm. observing them and giving them coaching. That's mm-hmm. how I view it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not even trying to be their friend. Mm-hmm. I'm not interested Maybe yeah. we'll end up be friends, mm-hmm. but but I'm not. That's mm-hmm. not what you hire me to be a coach. So I'm a coach. It it constantly forces me, and I would hope any coach to refine myself mm. to just be who mm. I am. Ooh, that's good. Refining to be yourself. And what do you, what would you say are some of the differences between being someone's friend and coach? If someone kind of thought like, well, I have my friends to talk to. What's going to be the difference? Right. Like for you, what feels different in being someone's friend versus their coach? Friendship, first of all, is not going to have like money wrapped up in it. Right. Where right. You're not, like people <laughs> are not paying me to be their friend. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't. Friendship and community, which friendship and community go together, I think. Or obviously, I guess. <laughs> um, hopefully. Hopefully they do, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it should be organic. Mm. You vibe with the people you vibe with, mm-hmm. and you share yourself with them, and they share themselves with you, mm-hmm. and you are at a, you understand that you're together organically, mm-hmm. and choose to be together. Mm-hmm. So, the, mm-hmm. so the exchanging of value is, mm-hmm. I, I have, I'm committed to you, and you're committed to me, and we have agreements about what that commitment means, mm-hmm. and, a, and a lot of it is unsaid. And maybe more of it should be stated more overtly. Maybe that would help friendships. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and so whenever you just need a hug, you know, don't call your life coach if you ever just <laughs> need a hug. Or uh-huh. don't call your Reiki or mas- massage per- or anything. All these things. <laughs> no, those people that you're paying are professionals getting you, giving you a service. Give, mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. a friend... As I feel like as a coach, I'm liberated to say whatever I mm. feel needs to be said mm. for a stated intention. Mm. That makes sense. Not just community. Yes, yeah, so you're going to be more honest with him than I'm hearing. Right? Well, for instance, I can right? be. Because you know, if it, you know it's going to be perhaps I for can the be. stated intention, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect now, sense. But I think that's cool to like address. Yeah. Ultimately, I think we're putting ourselves out of business because we'll all be in communities of friends where we can all we're all comfortable giving each other the feedback Mm. that people need Mm -hmm. to hear Mm -hmm. and I have lost (laughs) friendships some of them have some of them came back some of them ended forever Mm -hmm. because people said things to each other Mm -hmm. that the other person didn't want to hear Uh Uh that is not mature to me Uh like that's not okay to Uh me it's okay if I'm never friends with that person again mm. or I don't see them ever again. Mm. But to leave things not resolved mm. with resentment hanging, lingering mm. is not mature. Mm. So so I just think we're at a point right now where uh, friendship and community is weak. Mm, mm-hmm. in a lot of places yeah. and that sucks yeah. to admit and uh, there's a lot of lonely people and I think a lot of the we were talking about violence before we turned the camera on 
and shootings, because we just had one here in Long Beach, I, these things come from lack of... At, at the end of the day, it all boils down to the fact that there wasn't enough love and friendship or community in that person's life. I, I, it, it, I think it really is that I, simple. I agree too. It's not a simple fix, but mm -hmm. it is that simple. Mm, wow. It's wow. not, yeah. Gosh, I love that you that you did bring that up because I was hoping that might come up. And because I feel that too when I hear about the violent acts, definitely is like a compassion for the people who enacted the crime, even right, because it's like they must, right? But, and how, and then it coming back to the, like the life coach role and the therapy that we can do with these things, it's interesting to consider how as we make these shifts within ourselves, it can help our friendships, right? Help our sense of community and even change things like violence in the world, right? As just more of us are looking at our, our um, dark secrets, right? And yeah. getting into the self-awareness and yeah. having, uh, but yeah, how important community is to our well-being. And then things like violence being maybe just like an indicator of just deep feelings of not enough community for a lot of us, right? In addition to the trauma that we all have. Yeah. People, I think violence, even on nation level violence, uh, comes from needs not being met or perceived a perceived lack of needs being mm. meant, met, or just good old fashioned like pride and racism, and we're mm -hmm. going to take over the world because we think we're right and we need to make everyone right. That that happens too, mm -hmm. but I think that also can boil down to just needs not being met mm. or emotional needs not being met. Perhaps mm. that's so clear because yeah, I just yeah, I thought it would be so interesting to hear from someone like you who's got the military background and that understanding and even having lived in that world well, and are, loved it maybe at a time and then yeah, now being sure. such a spiritual practitioner to yeah hear your response well, here's, about these kind of things. Here's what occurred to me. Here's here's a very simple thing that occurred to me in the Navy. On active duty, on the ship, middle of the ocean, on a warship, that occurred to me. Like they Especially after, and then it just kept occurring to me as I came home, people thanked me for my service. As if our freedoms in America, which you can argue how much freedom we actually have, but anyway, <laughs> we do live in a pretty free country. Mm. You can be entrepreneurial here. Uh, if, if you are from a privileged class. So, mm -hmm. so without getting into all these semantics and all these other conversations that need to be had about mm -hmm. class and wealth and that, mm -hmm. is America just like, do I feel privileged to have been born here? Yeah, I do. It's, mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's relatively good mm -hmm. to be me in America. Uh, so, which is why I kind of wanted to go serve in the first place, mm -hmm. to give back. To be like, I want to help advance and preserve this. So quite simply, what I realized being in the Navy was, this is I'm not advancing and preserving American liberty and freedom and justice by being in the Navy. Mm. I'm out here bullying other countries mm. into bending to our economic will. So I just realized that while I was in the Navy. And that's part if of I true. want to make America great, yeah. <laughs> keep America great, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I want, then it is inner work that needs to be done inside mm. the country. I don't need to be on a warship on the other side of the world. Mm. Like I have so much better things I can do with my time to make America great here mm. and inside myself than bullying other countries into, uh, uh, you know, bending to our economic will perhaps. Mm. Mm, I love that. It makes sense that your service has turned into helping people with their inner work. Yeah. Right? As you see that as a, yeah. maybe a solution, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's too much. Our military, it's too much. It's too, it's just, it's just insane. And I think, I think, I think, I think a lot of people get that. Perhaps when, most people get that our military budget is insane. Right, right, right. And that's such part of why I think so many people get disheartened and just feel like there's nothing we can do. And so I don't know, what do you, how do you feel like people, 
what, would, what do you recommend to people who are having a hard time with just like being in the world and feeling good about humanity with things like shootings going on, you know, up the street of all sorts where, right, it can just lead to more separation and even yeah. less feelings of community, even more of that. I mean, I don't know what, if you have like clients who are really struggling with that, like, and someone with your combined background, I don't know, how do you respond to that? I think it's forcing people who have the capacity inside them already more than others anyway. Mm. The capacity, people who, I think I'm one of them, mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. my wife, mm -hmm. lots of people, but that have, certain people have the capacity inside themselves to refine themselves and experience humility and allow the humility to purify them. And then their beingness is enriched and they literally become a more powerful person and they can go into their world and make a difference. Yeah. And they also have the humility of knowing I don't have to be the next Martin Luther King or Gandhi or whatever. Mm. I can just be in my neighborhood mm. taking on as much as I can. And then if I end up, you know, getting some, some spotlight or some more national international fame for it, fine. Mm. But I'm not chasing that in and of itself. Mm. And I think we sh would be well served to respect and honor the fact that there are so many people at the local level. And uh, I think a lot of people, yeah, okay. Mm. So, so those people who just seem, it's for the, the pain mm. of what we're going through is forcing people who do have the capacity mm to embark on their spiritual journey to actually do it. Uh, so people are getting into it and doing yes. it. Yes, and, and if you've got that even leadership pull, this is, it makes sense too, because you're like speaking to the leaders right now. Too. Yes. Like, that's kind of what it sounds like you're saying. And that would be called the leaders, right? The people who are just ready to lead us. Well, in, right? oh, no, no, this if first step is the, this first step I'm talking about is the mm -hmm. introspective hermit, hermetic experience of going yeah. inside yourself yeah. that and it can be very lonely experience mm. of coming to grips with yourself and having your own existential crisis mm -hmm. and figuring out who who am I, what the hell am I actually doing on this earth really what am I doing here <laughs> and coming up with an answer that you can live with and grow with and mm. and uh, and enriches people around you then mm. Then step back, then come back into the real world mm. and start exerting that power. That makes sense. And Do so, the inner work and then you can talk about leadership. Yeah, then come back and figure out, well, not, you don't have to like be a leader no, if you no. do that. Yeah, yeah. I am interested in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't, not in organizations right now where I have leadership. Mm. I have been. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I enjoy that. But... But then come back and start exerting your power in your neighborhoods and in your communities from that new perspective mm -hmm. that you gained from going through that inner journey, the, you know, the hero's journey, uh, the, the spiritual journey that mm -hmm. many people have described, many faiths, many traditions have described this journey. Uh, people have really latched on to the Hindu yoga version of it, mm -hmm. you know, it's mm -hmm. hyper popular these days mm -hmm. and it's a good one. It's not the only one. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly use tons of aspects of yoga. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, so all, so notice I haven't, I haven't labeled what's happening good or bad. Mm. I don't like the mass shootings. I mean, I really, obviously I can label that bad, mm. but what's happening I think is just forcing people into mm. their inner journey. Mm. And then as pe as more and more people come out of the inner journey, those people are going to network together mm. and, right. and, and be able to exert power and help and then help other people and get, and then we go out, I think, and enroll other people to go on the journey. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. was everyone as willing, is everyone in the world as willing and eager as I was to go on the journey? No, mm. I, 
bluntly no and I think it's part of my power to be quite honest about it mm. is that when I faced my demon I said all right I'm gonna fight it mm. I'm gonna take this shit on mm. certainly had a lot of help a lot of people kept me alive mm. a lot of people I have a I have a community and I have friends mm. which is a big reason I didn't commit suicide mm. if I if I was one of these veterans without friends mm. I may have committed suicide I felt like it but so I'm not saying I just all alone figured it out on my own not at all mm. well that makes sense to but, your mind is that to allow in help yeah is help is yeah. helpful <laughs> but I do think I do think I as a person just ha have this propensity and willingness to be like all right mm -hmm. this is not going to feel good this is going to be really humbling and and Many people have come before me who helped me feel safe going on my inner journey. And a lot of people are going to come after me. And I love finding those people mm -hmm. and being like, go, do it. Mm -hmm. And then they want to come back. And I look, I've had, it's at the point now where people are like, oh, I want to see you. And I'm like, nah, mm -hmm. you don't, I'm, I'm not. I'm not taking your money anymore. Mm, mm. You need to go yeah. do what I already recommended to you. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Like, nope. You're Don't. Ready. You're just coming to me because you want to feel good. Because uh, like, like it feels good to have a comp, like hang out with me. I agree. <laughs> right. But we're not friends. <laughs> That's awesome. You're a client, you and know. you need to go on your inner journey. Yeah. And when you come out of it, I'll be here. Yeah. It's time to apply. There's nothing. Yeah. The stuff. Yeah. Right? yeah. Wow. That does show that you're willing to be that kind of coach that's willing to say something. They may not want to hear, which is even, no, I'm not going to have a session with you because that's not going to help you. You yeah. need to go do what we already talked yeah. about, right? Yeah. So, or I've told people that. straight up, you're depressed. Mm. I'm not a therapist. Mm. I'm, that's outside of my scope. Mm -hmm. I don't have a license to do psychotherapy with mm -hmm. you, which is probably what you need. You probably use some traditional therapy. And yeah. Go work on your depression. Uh -huh. Here, here's a recommendation. Go do uh -huh. it. And then you would kind of like they could come back towards you after they've kind of resolved well, yeah. that on certain levels. Well, what I do help people with is conceptualize journaling hmm. and be like, here's how to set up a journaling practice so it's continuously feeding you your own feedback. Hmm. So if people can get to that point, that's basically mastery of journaling, in my opinion. Hmm. If you can really generate feedback for yourself hmm. out of a journaling practice, then, hmm. then great. Uh, then you have that kind of experience where you're writing down intentions and then it happens. Yeah. Okay, well, that's what you want journaling to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people get that journaling feels good. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm sad, I can just write down uh -huh. in my journal, I'm sad. <laughs> and I feel better just by... Let, okay, great. Uh -huh. But that's like... That's like the first step of yeah. journaling, uh -huh. <laughs> in uh -huh. my opinion. Yeah. And yeah. people think that's like it. Right? No. Yeah. yeah, it's like you've only just begun. Yeah. yeah, I'm excited for... And I feel like something like journaling is so powerful because so many people don't take pen to paper these days. So when you get back to doing it, it's such a tool for us that I feel like is wired to really um, woo, rewire us, right? Yeah. I think I think it's getting popular again. Yeah, I totally think it is. I yeah, think so it is. So for, yeah, for any adult now to get back to pen to paper in any ways is is interesting, right? Because I, I think a lot of people aren't even doing that in their days unless they're doing something like journaling because yeah. people do everything on the computer or the yeah. phone, right? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I love it. Yeah. Well, I think I'm so thankful. And I'm sure um, I'm out of the screen here, which is okay. Um, I've probably, like, easily taken up at least 30 minutes of your time. but That's fine. I got, I got to say what I wanted to... Something I've been, I want to say and I'm really harping on these days. Yeah, I was going to say if there's anything more you want to say. Well, just in summation, like, um, if you are a practitioner in the healing world and you mm -hmm. envision yourself that way, ask yourself it, what, what, like, the scarcity and abundance conversation. Like, mm. are you trying to heal your people so much that they never need you again? Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're like in massage, I get that, right. you know, you're going to have your person who comes to get a massage from you every week or month or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's fair. I mean, mm -hmm. I get that. But, I mean, 
are you doing everything you can to enroll people in their own deconstruction? Mm. Are you doing everything you can to enroll people into ownership of their own path? Mm. Really? Because if you're not, then I, I really view that as inappropriate, unethical mm. even. Mm -hmm. Like, that's it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I am working to put myself out of business. <laughs> I don't have... There are plenty of people on this planet. I'm not saying I'm perfect at this yet. I'm not saying I'm perfect at this and I'm just... Clients are rolling in and I got it all figured out. I'm not saying that. Uh, lately, I'm doing a lot better. Mm -hmm. So maybe <laughs> it's, it's happening. I'm sure it is. But um, there's always people out there that would benefit from working with me. Mm -hmm. I trust that. Mm. I trust the more pure I am, mm. that that'll just happen faster. Mm. Makes sense, yeah. So and you're always doing your inner work. As I keep doing it. my inner work, mm -hmm. it opens myself up to more potential people to mm -hmm. come into contact with more potential people and then actually resonate and connect with those people in an authentic way. Mm -hmm. And then, as this is just being a spiritual warrior, I guess. Mm -hmm. Just get as many people through their dark nights of the soul. Get as many people enrolled in going through their deconstruction, figuring out their limiting beliefs, mm -hmm. being willing to face their shame and guilt and regret and fear and anger, and get them to come up with a new, elevated, transformed, right? There's the other buzzword, transformation. Mm -hmm. Transformed view of who they are, Mm -hmm. on this earth and what the fuck we're doing. Mm -hmm. What am I doing here? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? And not everyone at that point then has to become a life coach. <laughs> right? That's not that's not the answer either. Yeah. But but we but I actually think we need more life coaches mm -hmm. or at least better ones. A lot of people are cynical about this industry mm -hmm. and rightfully so. I actually think we need more and better ones. Mm -hmm. And that it'll become less about life coaching and more of just a natural flow of, mm. of people in the community mm. that are um, valued and are able to have a life based on their ability to energetically serve people. Mm. Uh, so yes, I mean, I have a very big romantic vision about this all. Mm -hmm. I was liking it. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, and mm -hmm. I think it's a vision a lot of us spiritual people have. Mm -hmm. And... And, and this is where I tell spiritual people they got to get grounded. Mm. Like, it's fun to sit around. I can get lost in my journal and daydream and write fantasy stories mm. about the beautiful future anytime I want. At the end of the day, where does the rubber meet the road? It, meet, it meets the road anytime I'm with a person. And just like, for me, really, when I'm with a person and I'm talking with them and I'm listening... That's where the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. And am I grounded? Am I mm -hmm. demonstrating like, hey, I'm in my power. I'm willing to be in this body, on this physical plane. It doesn't always feel good, but I've chosen to be here. I'm getting like, I can feel the grounding happening in my body as you say that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, right? Um, yeah. yeah, which I'm sure, me too. I'm yeah. like needing to do that again and again and more and more. We do. Maybe right now, especially. All the time. At this time on the planet. All the time. I don't know. Yeah. Do you think it's like a special time on the planet with like the 2020 coming up? Such I don't know about literally, time. I don't know about literally the year 2020, uh -huh. but I do think it's a special time on the planet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I do. Mm -hmm. I do think okay. things are, it just, it just is. Things are just global. There's global awareness. There's the internet. There's instant communication with billions of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about how crazy that is. Mm -hmm. Like, basically, instant communication with over with built like with any, like anyone mm -hmm. uh, theoretically. Mm -hmm. uh, um, things moving rapidly. We really don't know what's going to happen, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and the biggest challenge is fear itself. I mean, mm -hmm. we're at this point mm -hmm. where the next for me, I really the next step in human evolution is that spiritual step. Yes, of like um, transcending fear or... or I mean, like, it's not fear. like we're going from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age or to the Iron Age. Mm -hmm. like, it's not that materials are, are evolving. They still are. Mm -hmm. Technology 
is still evolving, but those really aren't the things driving the next leap mm. in our experience as humanity. Mm. It's people willing to take on their fear, mm. people willing to be responsible for their own experience. Mm. Again, enroll people in their own deconstruction. I think the reason I say that is because I think when people are enrolled in their de deconstruction, they're going to figure that out anyway. Mm. I think that I my that. faith, mm. my faith is that. that I get someone enrolled in their mm. own deconstruction they're going to figure it out like, oh, yeah. we are all one. Oh, this is unity. Oh, I do need to be responsible for myself. I don't need to teach them that. I just yeah. need to get them uh, enrolled and be willing to take the journey all the way through. Yeah, the unity works, right? Yes. <laughs> once, they, once they get into that union, yes. right? <laughs> and the last thing I want them to do is be dependent on me. Right. For anything. Um, no, you go create your own thing. I'll mm -hmm. create my thing and create yours. Mm -hmm. But, but until they're enrolled in their own power and ability to create mm -hmm. their own thing, then sure, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And I, you can pay me to help you do that. Absolutely. And I will. <laughs> it's, like, it's almost like a kick-ass kick -ass father figure. But then it's like, Maybe. all right, baby bird, go fly. It's time. Like, you know yeah. it's time. Yeah. When they're back to feeling like a baby bird. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I'm, I'm excited about what you're up to. And um, well, you want to mention how people can find you besides here on Facebook if there's ways? Or this will also be on YouTube? This is the simplest yeah, so way right now. Facebook. Uh -huh. yep. Yes. Yeah. And it works. Yep, I'll agree. see it and I'll answer. Yep. Mm -hmm. I have other ways to get in touch with me that I use on other yeah. way platforms. and But I do respond to Facebook. Yes, yes. Yeah. Great. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So much. Yeah. It was fun dropping in. Yeah. I knew it would be. <laughs> and thank you for those of you here with us. We see some of those of you that we love <laughs> and slightly worship too. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Namaste, you guys. <laughs>